All right, guys, we're back. Here's part two of Skinner. If you haven't listened to part one, hit pause on this and go back an episode to make sure you've listened to it and then come on back. Are they gone? (laughs) (laughs) You're so tickled by yourself. (laughs) Okay, forget it. So what we talked about last time were the life and crimes of Clifford Olson Jr. For a quick little brush up, in case you've listened to 12 other episodes of other podcasts, here's what we talked about before. Clifford Olson spent most of his adult life in prison. He killed 11 children, and he only admitted to those murders when he was granted $10,000 for each. People were not pleased by this, but now at this part of the story, Clifford Olson is locked away in prison, and he can't hurt anyone, right? So let's head on back to the life and crimes of Clifford Olson. At this point in time, he's spending 23 hours a day in his cell in maximum security at the Kingston Penitentiary in Ontario, Canada. He spent his time in isolation since, of course, he would be a target for most of the prison. The bodies for money deal wasn't the only time that the handling of Clifford Olson would spark public outrage. Throughout his stay in prison, he would make the news again a few more times. In 1997, the Faint Hope Clause gave people another reason to take a stance against the government. This clause was basically a way to let prisoners out early. So the idea is if they fulfill 15 years of their life sentence, they can be up for parole. And then even if that wasn't the original sentencing. Yeah. So once you hit that 15 years in your life sentence, you can apply for parole. And then legally, you get to apply every two years. So people were really enraged because at 15 years, he's able to try to make parole. And also that name, Faint Hope. Yeah, I didn't research where that came from, but I'm sure it's like... We have a little bit of hope that you won't... No, I think it might be names. Interesting. We'll look into that. (laughs) Luckily, when he gets to the parole board... It took just minutes to be denied. Psychologists who were supposed to be speaking on his behalf were like, he's way too dangerous to ever be out. So again, in July 2006, he's back up and eligible for parole. He's now been in prison for 25 years. And of course, he decides he wants to apply for it. And of course, he makes headlines. So seven of the families had someone there in court that day so that they could uh, read the victim impact statements that they had written. Olson was flown on an RCMP jet for a four-day hearing, and it was immediately apparent that he was not going to get paroled. In fact, he himself made a comment about not not making parole. He just kind of wanted to waste resources, rehash the pain for the families. I mean, he was noted as like writing letters to these people to just relay these graphic details of what he did to their children. It's just disgusting. Yeah, well, if you're in prison 25 years and you can get a free jet ride to somewhere else yeah, that isn't the get prison out of walls, jail. I'm not saying no to that. Absolutely. He told courts then in this parole hearing that he was responsible responsible for 143 to 168 murders in both Canada and the U.S., but it doesn't appear that authorities either took it seriously or really looked into it much. But when you look at his travel, he did come to the U.S. quite often. I think mm-hmm. I mentioned earlier he was in the Northeast for a bit. He was in California, and we can see how quickly he can commit well, these yeah, crimes. Well, yeah, that spree, you know hard to think that that just kind of started and now I'm this expert and know where to put bodies and not get caught for all that time. When we had our own serial killer issues in the 80s, if he happened to be anywhere in the Mm -hmm. Northwest. Connected to anyone else. Oh, that was probably Ridgeway. Oh, that was Mm -hmm. this. That was that. I mean, because a kid is a runaway, they often would fall into prostitution or sex work in Washington. That's what Gary Ridgeway was focused on. So it could easily be written off as someone else. Well, and who's to say that he stuck with kids? Maybe he's looking around at that area and hearing the news and saying, oh, it's 30-something-year-old sex workers with brunette hair, that's who I'll use, and I'll just leave it to be pinned on that person. And he was never accused of of being dumb. He was definitely reckless like most psychopaths are, but he scored normally on intelligence, so he definitely could have gone that direction where he's like, yeah, I'll go there where there's lots of killers. Yeah. In March of 2010, more money controversy cropped up when the media discovered and then told the public that Olson was getting benefits from Canada while he was in prison for 11 murders. 
it was discovered that he received over a thousand dollars a month from old age pension and guaranteed income supplement. What? Yeah. The Canadian Taxpayers Federation ultimately came back and said that they would terminate these payments, but it wasn't until the media discovered it that they stopped this from happening. So who knows how many people were getting paid in their old age when in prison for murder. By 2011, the families of Clifford Olson's victims didn't need to worry about having to drag themselves to another hearing again. On September 30th, 2011, Clifford Olson died of cancer, and I cannot be the only person thinking, thank God. Mm -hmm. A lot was learned from these horrible things he committed, and because of that, a lot of changes happened in Canada. And of course, I hate to say good came out of this horrible thing, but it really does. Um, And in this case, a lot came out of it. So the first thing I wanted to bring up was the missing children's registry. So it's hard to imagine that there wasn't an organized way to track missing kids up until that point. But it wasn't until the late 80s that Canada started putting two and two together and realizing they needed it. So it, of course, took tons, hundreds, if not thousands of missing kids to finally get to this place. But they ended up getting this this database in place and, um, you know, maybe... Had they had it, a theme would have arisen faster, and they could have seen that gender wasn't really a factor in this guy's M.O., but of course, you know, we'll never know if that would have helped or not. And you can't help but think the U.S. and Canada through the years before the registries were created, how many kids, oh, they're runaways, they're runaways, so how many serial killers or one-off that got away with horrific things for so many years because... The kids were just dismissed. And it's every country. I think it it always takes a really horrible case to shed light on where the gaps are. Mm -hmm. Um, But then you have to also think the border issue. Like Canada and U.S. are so close. And how often are we communicating? Because we still have different registries. So I have to think police are working together to to fix that. But, you know, we have our own. They have their own. And if you can just hop over the border into Vancouver... You know. Well, especially in the 80s when there wasn't, you know, you didn't have to do your passport right. or anything like that. Just back and Very forth. easy for not only runaway, real runaways, but mm-hmm. also for these killers to just get out of their hometown and go do what they want to do elsewhere. Yep. The victims of violence movement also came out of this. So it's apparent that over the years, victims' rights really were not handled appropriately, whether it's from notifying families that somebody's getting out of prison or dismissing rape accusations. We've seen time and time again that these families are just kind of trampled all over. Um, So this particular uh, victims of violence, it helps provide support, whether it's financially or even with services like therapy or legal advice. Um, And so Darren, one of the victims, his mother actually helped found this. So I think that's really cool that, you know, they were the family that was out there putting posters and getting loud and annoying people. But she's like, let's go a step further and help found this, this company that's going to help people. So I think that's really cool. And she actually uh, synced up with Scott Newert, who was a prosec- a former prosecutor, to create this group. So That's awesome. Yeah, especially when you're trying to be the squeaky wheel to get any attention and being dismissed. Yep. Be like, okay, then we'll start our own thing. And that's often all these cases where the parents are the last ones seeking. You know, they're doing things like trying to get Congress to pass bills and, and really – let this not happen to everyone else. Like, yes, a horrible thing happened to my family. Let's do whatever we can to stop it from happening again. So I think that that's, I mean, that's awesome that somebody would step away from their own situation to make, Mm -hmm. make that better for everyone else. So then let's get back to that faint hope clause. So that, uh, was actually terminated. Thank goodness. Oh, good. So because of this, in 2011, they ceased that and you are no longer apply for parole until you have fulfilled your sentence. So that's good. Yeah. And then Bill C-31 denies payments of pension of old age income and prisoners during their incarceration. Yay. So they'd have to be out to get those funds. So, all right, that was the short version of Clifford Olson. And I think those of you who didn't already know him can understand why his own nickname beast of bc actually stuck because he is horrific and uh he got away and just imagine all of this that i talked about today was within those four years that Mm -hmm. he was out of prison in his adult life Mm -hmm. 
I mean, that's just mind boggling. Do you know, did you read anywhere that they kept his DNA and I had didn't. that on file? I for didn't, a but I know they did. I think, I, I believe there's a lot, and I can't speak for Canada, but I know we have a law in the US that if you've done a violent crime, like you have to give up your DNA when you're right. incarcerated. So I'm just curious if they have it and when they come across whether they find a body from. 20, 30 years ago Mm -hmm. or an unsolved case if there's DNA from California from the early 80s. I would imagine. Just to eliminate, you know. I would imagine. I didn't stumble across that, but I would imagine that any even body they discover that remotely fits this Mm -hmm. MO, they're going to wonder if it was him. And that might help close a lot of open cases. I mean, maybe he wasn't lying that he's killed over 100 people. He clearly can get a lot done in a short amount of time. Well, yeah, and had that MO of There's a kid, here's some booze, here's the pills, here's the weapon, here's, you know, he had it down to a science. Uh, One thing I wanted to talk about was the night that Olsen had killed Darren, his wife, Joan, who finally came out and started talking to people after she realized he really was a killer, Mm -hmm. she had recalled receiving a phone call from him and he was very upset, even crying. And she was at the time at his parents' house. And so he had asked to talk to his mother and the mother was very distraught and she didn't want to talk about it. And his wife always wondered about that. So when his mother was dying from cancer, she even asked, what was that phone call? Because she looks back and she thinks he must have told her that he must have told her what he had done. And I just keep coming back to that. Like, had she not been under so much psychological stress from her marriage, maybe she could have told police that, or maybe they could have questioned the mother. But it's that uh, that moment now again, like, moments. could they have caught him? And I, that, ugh, I hate it. Yeah. <laughs> but I wonder. Was there anything... What happened to Randy? Was he ever an accomplice? Was he ever I a victim? I don't know. I'm assuming he was, I mean... A victim of some sort, even though he's legally 19. I don't know, think he was still... involved in, I don't, my opinion, I don't think he was involved in anything other than the perhaps drugging and drinking of young girls, but he was kicked out of the car by Olsen, and I think he was under Olsen's spell as well, yeah. so I, I think he is a victim himself, really. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know what ever happened to him. It's something to look into. There is another story that is a likely victim of him that actually there were multiple incarcerated suspects. So I thought I'd tell you about it really quick. So it's really hard for police to go back to some of these cold cases. We we get that. But sometimes someone in prison will say, oh, yeah, I did that. And the police will look into it. So there's this one woman, Debbie Silverman. She was 21 years old and living in Toronto, Canada. And she was out with coworkers on the night of August 11th, 1978. And then she was never seen again. So three months after her disappearance, a teenager was walking through a wooded area on his family's property and discovered a disturbance, like animals had been digging at it and saw that an arm and a leg was poking out. So the police come and they discover that it's the body of Debbie. She was showing um, signs of rape and she was strangled to death. So while in custody in 1985, Clifford Olson actually confessed to this killing. He described attacking her. He described raping her in his car, taking her to the woods. And police never really followed through with it because they thought that um, another killer was the cause of it. They actually thought American serial killer Henry Lee Lucas did it because he also confessed. And then there was Uh. another person who confessed. So sometimes police may not close these cases simply because they're not reliable sources. You know, these people just want to be in the news again or to maybe get out of court, get into court rather, and get out of jail for the day. Well, yeah, you have all that narcissism. I was thinking about he clearly has ego, narcissistic personality disorder stuff going on because it's going to the same places over and kind of a take this cops. I'm going to the same spots and you still can't catch me. Mm -hmm. And so to hear of a victim that sort of fits in the MO, oh, yeah, that was me, I'd let me get in the headlines again. Let me let me get another $10,000 and I'll tell you yep. more, you know. I think he ruined that one for everyone, though. I don't think they're going to do that again. Yeah, <laughs> probably for the best. So have you heard of the psychopath test? Yes, I've taken it. What'd you score? Very low. Oh, that's good. You, so, were, pro- you were pretty high. Ha yeah. uh-huh, ha uh-huh. ha. <laughs> well, higher than you probably, but. Absolutely. So I thought it was interesting. The develop- The original developer of that, Robert D. Hare, he created that. Um, I think it's a 40-point checklist 
in the 1970s, and he's actually Canadian, which I found very interesting because when Clifford Olson was given the test, he scored 38. So in order to be classified as a psychopath, you have to score a 30 or higher, and he's literally probably the highest anyone's ever checked off on that list. Wow. I I just found that interesting. Yeah. Um, I scored a 13, so I'm fine. Okay. Just putting that out there. I mean, you're halfway there. (laughs) Almost. (laughs) I don't remember my, I think like five or something. I think it's more than that. I mean. (laughs) Anyway, I wanted to say it's 99.7th percentile for male prisoners is how high he was. Like that's, I mean, who could possibly be in that point three (laughs) above him? I can't imagine. Wow. Well, another psychopath. Dead and gone. Yeah. And off the street. Goodness. Uh, reminds me of uh, our buddy Mike at Dark Poutine. Oh, yeah. Had that story. I believe it was episode 10 where he had an encounter with someone and it was so well known, the Beast of BC, that it crossed his mind that this man that was trying to attack him is this that guy. Is this. Yeah, it stood out for him. And actually, guys, we have a treat for you. At the end of this episode, we have a little interview with. Mike Brown. So stick around and you can hear him and his story as well as meet author Mitzi Soretto and hear about their new book that it just came out and you can get a copy yourself. Take it away, Mike and Mitzi. The end. That's it. Hey guys, today we have a fun little treat. Murder in the Rain is sitting down with author Mitzi Soretto at her book signing at Elliott Bay Book Company in Seattle, Washington, to talk to her about her new book, The Best New True Crime Stories, Serial Killers. Not only that, we have a cherry on top of this delicious Sunday. Oh boy. Mike Brown from the podcast Dark Poutine is joining us as well. So thank you guys for being here. Yes, thank you. Thank you. We're Thanks still- for schlepping up from, from Portland. Right. Thanks schlepping for having us. Up. We took the train up. It was nice. I oh. just wish we could have seen out the window. I there. had to cross a border, so. <laughs> oh, okay. You, you get all the points. <laughs> well, they asked me what I was coming to do, and I said I was coming to uh, see an author who'd written a serial killer's book. What'd they say? Is the author a serial killer? <laughs> I'll is never tell. Is that a memoir? <laughs> yeah. I Maybe. told them they're going to revoke my Nexus card now. <laughs> exactly. God. Well, you know what? I was actually going, uh, gravitating between being a writer and an artist. Oh, really? And I spent most of my uh, misspent youth doing that, you know, painting and writing, painting and writing, painting and writing. And then I was, uh, when I went to uh, college, I was training to be an artist. My mother was sort of saying, oh, you know, you can't make any money as an artist. Ha, like you can as a writer, right? (laughs) (laughs) And uh, so I went to journalism school. And uh, instead of becoming a journalist, it sort of reignited the writing bug. And I just started to write. And that's all I've been doing ever since. So what was the first published? Uh, did, was it a paper? Was it a book? I started, I ended up getting, you know, I wrote several novels and I got really close with agents and and then it just didn't happen. And then I accidentally got into writing erotic fiction. <laughs> That I was hate my when next that question. Yes, and so that's, uh, yeah. you have a load of titles that interest me, and the one I wrote down that I have to try is the Pride and Prejudice, Hidden Lust. Hidden Lust. Oh, that's fun! It's like <laughs> Benny Hill and Monty Python meets Jane Austen. Oh, that's good. That's my favorite book. Oh, so good. I'll be excited to see a new twist. Yeah. Oh, it's it's a new twist, all right. And interestingly enough, the Brits um, really enjoyed the book, and they got the point that it's a parody. But right. uh, some Americans didn't quite get the point. It's a parody. Well, I'll hopefully lean. <laughs> on the fact that my dad is from the UK and maybe I'll get it. There you go. <laughs> yeah. You've written you've written erotic fiction. You've written mystery, right? Yeah, you've written gothic true crime. Stuff, yeah. What's your favorite thing to write? I, you know, I like gothic, but you know, I'm right now in, in true crime mode, so it's hard to say favorite because my brain is in, true, in true crime. crime. <laughs> so, you know, when I'm working on it, then it's my favorite. It's like you ask a band what's their favorite album and it's the one, the one that on. just yeah. came out. That's a great answer. Yeah. yeah, it's true though. It's true. So I read on your website that you actually teach erotic fiction? I did. I did. I actually pioneered the erotic writing workshop in the UK and Europe, in the rest of Europe. That's amazing. Again, yeah, it started out by accident. Um, A a writer's group in, in of all places, Doncaster, (laughs) in the north of England, said, hey, would you do an erotic writing workshop? And then suddenly, um, I'm doing literature festivals. I'm doing uh, (laughs) uh, workshops in Greece, like two-week-long courses. So so I, yeah, so I, I kind of made a cottage industry of, of it and then yeah I went as long as I could and then it's time to move on two-week course so would people like 
go and stay at a specific yes. area. That is yes. so cool. I, I, I've I been, would do that. Yeah, I did. I did actually. Uh, I taught uh, erotic writing uh, on three occasions in three Greek islands. Oh, yeah. So I got to travel, and uh, so it was almost like a paid holiday. Yeah. So that was pretty cool. And uh, yeah, so it was it was fun. You know, we we every day would have like a couple hours session, and then uh, I gave them homework and. Ooh, what kind of homework? <laughs> <laughs> Writing homework, writing uh, homework. Don't I'm feeling a little verklempt on <laughs> Poor Mike. I mean, before we dive into the reason we're here and talk about true crime, I just wanted to list a few titles for our listeners so that they can go look at them. These ones appealed to me the most. Love, Lust, Zom- and Zombies, The Wild Passions of Dorian Gray, and Thrones of Desire, Erotic Tales of Swords, Mist and Fire. Yes. So good. So I, these are on my reading list. If you go to my Goodreads, they'll be there so you guys can join me. <laughs> are you contemplating cro- like crossing your passions into some sort of finding like the sexiest true crime that's happened? And- uh, but you never know because I'm, uh, the, you know, the best new true crime stories has become a, new, a series for me and I'm working on the second book as we speak. So maybe that could be an interesting one. <laughs> Sexy, Sexy true crimes. Crime. <laughs> If you ask Luca McNaughta, he thinks his is the sexiest. (laughs) Don't get us started. That guy. (laughs) Did you guys watch the Netflix documentary? No, I refuse to. It's fascinating. It's very good, though. I can't. I I hate that guy, but it is well done. (laughs) Didn't we talk about him the other week on? We did. (laughs) Canada's very hot right now with Luca McNaughta talk. You know, according to him, yeah. Okay, so your latest book, The Best New True Crime Story, Serial Killers, is an anthology collection focused on serial killers. What made you decide to start this? Um, You know, a lot of things that have happened in my life or in my professional career have been by accident. You know, erotic writing was an accident. Uh, True crime has been a bit of an accident. Uh, I was brainstorming ideas with a publisher who I worked with at another publishing house, and she joined a new place and we and we were talking about what would be interesting to do and mostly I do fiction but I have done some nonfiction and she was saying you know it would be great if you would uh, consider doing some true crime and I'm like yeah I'm up for it uh, so we brainstormed some ideas uh, I gave her several proposals and uh, the serial killers one went out for the first one <laughs> I was getting my hair done a couple of months ago, and I made a comment about having a true crime podcast, and this girl whips around and tells me her life story and about a girl she went to high school with who was murdered, and they've never solved it, and it's just like I connect with strangers on the subject all the time. <laughs> Do you mm. find that, too? Like, it, well, you meet people because yeah. of your book? Uh, well, <laughs> funny enough, my, my friend's uh, husband was a f- former law enforcement, and he's saying, you better be careful who you get emails oh, from. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to be the topic of your next book. (laughs) (laughs) I've got some stories. So far, nobody strange has come out of the woodwork. I mean, other than Mike, of course. (laughs) Goes without saying. Yeah. He'll have his moment. So when you created this book, did you get to pick the chapters yourself? Did you pick people that you wanted to author? How did that come together? Uh, Well, because it's the first book, I wanted to hedge my bets, and I I decided to come up with a uh, a list of people that I would approach, uh, not for the full amount of openings in the book, but Mm. for maybe about half. So I reached out to uh, some authors that I've worked with before. Uh, I reached out to people who I knew of through reputation, uh, and then some other people like, dodgy people like Mike. (laughs) And uh, I I saw his name on a bathroom stall. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) For great true crime, call this guy. If you you don't want a good time, call Mike. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I just um, thought I wanted an interesting mix of people. I didn't want uh, just like the same exact kind of writer in there, so I wanted a good mix, and so I I reached out to all those people and uh, they were interested and I let them write about who they wanted to write about. I didn't assign serial killers. And then the rest of it um, was just open to whoever submitted material and what I liked. So I, I disseminated the call really wi- widely for, for submissions. And uh, so it was like 50% whom I approached and the rest of it was fate. I mean, I love it. I So I got your copy that you sent me, which was awesome. I started reading it and I thought, okay, we can do an episode on one of these. Maybe there's somebody in the Pacific Northwest. And I came upon your chapter, Mm -hmm. which we consider the Northwest. So that's actually the episode that this is going to air with. Oh, wow. Is the Beast of BC. Wow, cool. Yeah, so let's talk about you for a minute in your chapter. Okie doke. How did you pick it? (laughs) Um, Actually, there's a bit of a backstory there. Uh, When I was 11, a week away from my 12th birthday, 
uh, somebody tried to abduct me and dragged me into the woods and told me he was going to do various and sundry bad things to me. And I got away from this person, but it really traumatized me as a kid, those kind of things. But uh, a week after that happened, the news about uh, Clifford Olson broke. So I've always had uh, a spot in my psyche for Clifford Olson and his thing and really relate to his victims because of what I was going through mm-hmm. at that time. And uh, seeing, seeing his face all over the news and this person who had done these awful things to little boys like me was terrifying. Mm-hmm. But it made, like I say, a big impression on me as a youth. And uh, it's one of the reasons that I got into true crime as an interest. I was so. going to ask you that. So you did uh, episode 10, I believe, of yep. your podcast. You talk about Mike this. Meta Monster, yeah. Right. And I listened to that and it really resonated with me. And I started thinking about other people I know who have had experiences similar and just how it stayed with them their whole mm-hmm. life. And almost that's why they're into this stuff. They want to hear these stories. They want to share them so other people know these bad people are out there. Yeah. Do you find that that's what made you have a podcast? Partly, yeah. Uh, I always wanted to be in radio. Um, I was just one of those kind of kids that love to talk and blah, blah, blah. But I didn't want to go into radio the traditional way. I went to, uh, my hometown has a little radio station called CKBW in Nova Scotia. And uh, I toured the radio station with the manager and he said, you can start here sweeping floors. And I thought, no, I, <laughs> I, I do not want to be I that. Am. I am not a floor sweeper. <laughs> I am not a floor sweeper. I've been doing like trading tapes and those kind of things with my friends. At the time it was cassette tapes. I wanted to be on air and it just didn't look like that was going to happen for me. So years go by and I still have that sort of idea to do this thing. And then podcasting came along and I said, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Yeah. So get a captive audience. To Ex- talk. <laughs> exactly. <Yep. laughs> exactly. All they have to do is click to download something and then they it's can. Free. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I listened to your episodes on the beast of BC. Mm-hmm. Um, good job, by the way. I Thank they you. Were really well done. You'd, I tend to kind of go a little too graphic. I think I yes. might have to go back mm-hmm. and fix a few things. But. <laughs> it's tough. It's tough to, to walk that line. I always try to, I think about if if somebody's parent is listening to this, I always yes. l- think about that when I'm writing an episode. If somebody's brother or sister is listening to this, how are they going to feel about what I'm talking about yeah, and my approach? You're right, and it is a fine line because you really want to get these people's names out there so they're remembered because mm-hmm. the, the further along in time we go, I didn't even know Clifford Olson. I didn't right. know his victims. So I felt like it's my job to get their name out there for our listeners so they know who they are. Yeah. But yeah, there is that line where I don't Mm -hmm. want to hurt anyone's feelings or cross the line. Right. But at the same time, I don't want to hold back what happened. It was gruesome. It's the worst. I do a lot of thinking about what what would make a person want to do such a horrible thing to another person. And I can't get there myself. I just, I can't get there myself. Because you're not a psychopath. Because I'm, well, (laughs) some people say, but... uh, um, I do a lot of reading and, and because I wanted to understand that guy. Yeah, that's you know? how I am. I wanted to understand that guy who wanted to drag me into the woods and who knows what he was going to yeah. do to me. Yeah. Uh, he told me he was going to break my arm if I, if I screamed and other foul things that I'd rather not talk about right now. It just, it depends on my mood. Sure. And you can hear it in episode 10 if you're that yeah. curious. That episode has translated into a lot of emails from people who are thanking me for having the courage to be honest about my feelings around that stuff and and talk about these things and in in relation to people like Clifford Olson and uh other killers that we've talked about so because you're able to give a voice to people that don't have a voice anymore they just yeah. become a name and a yeah. victim number and, and I think that's the special the sauce yeah them. that's our special sauce is just that kind of uh compassionate approach that we have and people don't typically expect expect that from two white guys you know (laughs) it's uh, a lot of them are just you know we'll have a beer and we'll talk about true crime but you don't hear a lot about what they're personally going through in that moment when we're recording a lot of times I get upset and I have to stop because what I'm talking about is so horrific and people say well wow, how do you do that? It comes like you just talk about it like it's nothing. It's like... Cut it out. Exactly. <laughs> We've had you don't few. hear I me. I cried more than once or we had to stop yeah. and retake it. And 
human, obviously. But, exactly. And then we're like, should we put that in or not? Like, mm -hmm. people should know that it's not like we're just at the water cooler talking about kid yeah. crimes. Like, it's yeah. I don't want what I do to be just murder porn because that's there's enough of that out there. Yeah. Uh, I want it to have something a little extra. Let's investigate further kind of thing. Yeah, I like that. We really um, tried to do the same. So it, I appreciate your podcast for that reason. I, I find it to be really good. And Thank you. I think you achieved what you wanted with that episode. You said maybe I'll inspire someone. I to, have. Yeah, to recognize their story and that they don't have to feel ashamed. I, I got an email from somebody a few months ago, and she said uh, she had been thinking about what had happened to her. She hadn't reported it, and it had happened years ago, and she thought nobody's going to listen. And then she heard me tell my story, how I reported it 20-odd years after I had to re-report things because I knew more information about this individual. But uh, she went ahead and did that, and she emailed to let me know that... After reporting, she is now going through the process of a court case against oh, this wow. person. Wow. And I'm like, whoa. That but it was all like, this worth it. That's I, what it's about. I just sat there and cried when I read that email, just like, wow, that's 100% makes it worth it. And this next week, uh, I'll be speaking to the Edmonton Police Service about um, how, uh, as a victim of a sexual assault, uh, how I felt growing up and what, why I didn't want to talk about it and why I was afraid to report this guy, all this kind of thing. So I'm talking to new police officers who can hopefully, the next 11-year-old they run into who's had this happen to them, they'll know how to handle them Recognize a little better. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, it's amazing that I get an opportunity to do stuff like yeah, that. And how interesting too that you happen to not only have that happen to you, but have this bug to be on radio yeah. and to be able to bring the, both of those together to make that happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, I went through some very dark times in my life. I was a, a drug addict and an alcoholic for a long time. And uh, now I've been sober more than half my life. So it's kind of, uh, I kind of know both sides of the coin, you know, like mm -hmm. I've been down some very dark roads myself. and for All the more uh, reason to talk about it. Absolutely. can relate right? Mm -hmm. On either side. My dark past is my greatest asset. That's the way I look at it. Wow, that's deep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> deep as a mud puddle. <laughs> so did you cover that case in that episode before you wrote the chapter or how yep. did that work? No, we, we had covered the case, uh, but I wanted, I felt it wasn't right mm -hmm. and I wanted to rewrite it. No. And, and Mitzi <laughs> sort of gave me the opportunity to do that. So that, isn't that funny? I was reading and I like a lot of this I can hear in the show. Yeah. But I could tell you changed it too. Yeah, I did. So that's great. Hmm. So how did you guys feel about collaborating? How did that work? Did did you guys interact during the process? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, when Mike submitted the work and then, you know, as an editor, I actually do edit. You know, okay. I pretty much make everyone work for their, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, we had some things, you know, I a couple of people wrote a bit too much. It was too long. So I say, Mike, you need to trim yeah. 500 words. Can you trim enough? Because the book ended oh, up that's getting... that's hard. Yeah, well, it was hard because I ended up, I exceeded the page uh, count, the, the, the word count. And I kept emailing my publisher, can we go? Up to 80, they 000. gave you a limit? Uh, well, they normally do, yeah. they do, because obviously for print run and costs and whatnot. Oh, okay. and so they go, oh, well, okay, we'll give you this much, but don't go over, please, please, please. <laughs> so I'm like, Mike, Mike, can you do some more trimming? <laughs> I did, you know? yeah. Yeah, so yeah, it, I, we interacted quite a bit. Yeah. It's that whole kill your darlings thing. Oh, <laughs> that sentence, I really love it. Well, you know what? <laughs> there it's gone now. Yeah, but you actually told me you learned a lot in the process. I did. Yeah, so. And I'm writing a book for Harper Collins right now. Oh, you so. are? There you yeah. go. See, wow. the rest is history. Mike worked with yeah. me, and I hope that I will be getting a dedication. In <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> oh, for sure. You're. I yeah, I'm definitely going to. At the very least, <laughs> plus a piece of the royalties. <laughs> <laughs> What's that going to be about? Are you uh, allowed to tell us? 25 true crime, uh, unexplained mystery kind of thing. You guys, we got to get on this. <laughs> I know, really. <laughs> they came to me. Really? Oh, yeah. Just out of the blue, they came to me. Well, they, Harper Collins Canada was looking for somebody who, in Canada, who was 
talking about true crime and writing and those kind of things. And they said, well, you have like 90 episodes. I'm pretty sure you can write. Pick a couple. Yeah, you, well, know. I know something. you know what you're doing, I think. I'm, I'm pretty good <laughs> at, uh, it's, I feel like it's building a Lego uh, building right mm. now. Like, cause I know what all the elements are going to be. And it's just a matter of plugging Making them in. The pieces fit. Yeah. Yeah. I was talking about how we create episodes and I think we're all, we're pretty different on how we do it. I like to read all of my sources and do my outline as I go and then deep dive after Mm. it's, I I don't know, like what's your process as a, as a writer, as a podcaster, like how do you guys do that? Well, you know, I'm sort of, I got to get my head into today's book because I'm in the book that I'm currently working on, but Mm. it's, which is the next in the series. Yeah. It'll be on true. It's best new true crime stories, small towns, Mm -hmm. dead giveaway what that's about. (laughs) But uh, Yeah. But it's just, um, you know, I write, I write a story for the book as well. And then obviously it's dealing with all these other people and getting a coherent introduction together. I just sort of compile things and put notes down and do different word, open up different word documents and just it's it is like a lego thing or a, or a big jigsaw puzzle and and that's kind of how it is you know jigsaw puzzle or lego yeah <laughs> yeah i'm i'm writing an episode of dark poutine a week and then on top of that i'm trying to bang out a chapter for my book every week as well it's not due until october of this year but Staying on track is key, though. I, yeah, and I would like to have it early to the to the editors so they can say, "Hey, that guy's yeah, make quick. a good and, impression." <laughs> <laughs> well, and, be careful; you don't want to set a standard. No. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, oh, sometimes it's months. good to let it sit a while. Oh, yeah. Yes. Ferment, and it then depends come back on the story. It depends on the story. Um, a few of them I will do that with, and I can't do that with episodes of the show no. because no. I write the week that we record. Mm. So, oftentimes, I'm listening to the show and I'm like, ah. I, I've you learned something new and I want to, I want to yeah. put it in there. That's what blog posts are for. Sure. <laughs> and well, I do that sometimes. Because it's like, I, oh, I could have put that oh, yeah. in or yeah. why didn't I word it but this that's way? to be expected. We all do that, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. But I'm having fun. I mean, this is just fun to me. Uh, I don't have a real job anymore. Like I'm, I do <laughs> I this full time. The dream. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Unless you're my boss and you're listening. <laughs> I really enjoy it. I love my job. I'll be there every and day. And don't get me wrong. I know I'm extremely lucky to be in the in the place I'm in. And I don't feel like I'm any different than anybody else. It just I just happen to be in the right place at the right time for a lot of stuff to happen to me and you know I hear other shows and I'm thinking why isn't this show massive some of these people are amazing they're telling amazing stories what Alan and I are doing now um, it was Alan's idea but uh, KCAA in Los Angeles is a show that or is a channel that uh, Alan R. Warren and myself do uh, a radio show on every week and Alan is now taking podcasts that are unsigned and playing an episode of oh, a podcast cool. every week once or twice. That's kind nice. Of kind of so, pass on. Exactly. Exactly. So to let people in Los Angeles, Palm Springs. And, uh, and I love that. I feel so many people you know, that we've talked to that do podcasts and there's kind of this inherent um, competition and that yeah. kind of thing. It's like, we're all in it together. Yeah, like totally. we gotta lift Share each other the up. Same listeners. Yeah. Exactly. I don't listen to just one. No. True crime. Podcast. Nobody does. Like, I was telling like someone the other 32. day. You're yeah. talking like 16 hours a week. <laughs> if someone's listening every day at work, that's a lot of podcasts. Yeah. Just get out there. So. <laughs> exactly. So, and that's what I'm trying to do too. A lot of people gave me a leg up when I first started. For example, I went to CrimeCon by myself in Nashville. Um, just. Okay, I'm going to do this. I didn't know what was going to happen, but I met all kinds of cool people there who taught me all kinds of things. Uh, Tyler from Minds of Madness just said, hey, do you want half of our table? Aww, and I was like, awesome. what? And like, you don't even really know that's me. That's so nice. But yeah, he Maybe gave it's me. Because you're Canadian, it, it is. and so is he. <laughs> so is he. Oh, there it is. There you go. That yeah. Canadian connection, yep. classic. Yeah. But uh, yeah, kidding. so I just <laughs> shilled my dark poutine stickers and things off Tyler's table, and and uh, was treated like a peer by some of the biggest podcasts on the planet. And I thought, wow, I can do that too. Mm-hmm. You know, let's just keep at it. Mm-hmm. So, are you going to go to Orlando this year? Oh yeah, are you guys? <laughs> Maybe. Do it. We really want to. Use Poutine 2020 
to buy your, <laughs> to buy your tickets. You'll get ten oh. percent off. Oh, okay. Yes, we have crime a coupon condo. code for you. Yeah, there you Which go. is what we're hoping for. Com- or Comic Con. I did that. You Comic- did that I said that. Not Comic Con. Not Comic Con. Crime Con. It's a blast. Like it really is. You guys should go. I really want you. You won't regret it. And I love Orlando because Wizarding World is my happy place. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) Okay, so are you guys doing any touring with the book? Are you you have more stops along Um, the way? We do. Um, The other week we were supposed to do a gig up at uh, Chapters Indigo in uh, the greater Vancouver area, but that was when we had all that snow and that, yeah, so that got, we, everyone decided this is not a good day to do an event. So I'm I'm just actually now in communications with another chapters in to go and uh, we'll be doing a signing at some point in March. Uh, I just have to get back to them with some Yeah, let us know and we'll post it for everyone. Oh, sure, great. Anyone in the area. So your next book, and the next one in the series, when are you thinking that's going to be out? Uh, oh, it's already scheduled to be out for July, and it's available oh. for pre-order. Okay, oh. good. Well, uh, sign me up. Fast. We will definitely ha- get our listeners to read this one. It's great. So how many total chapters were oh in Oh, my that God. One? How many? Do I have to count them? I no, don't even I think <laughs> well, it's, it's 16 it's or something. It's a lot. It's a, I mean, they're great. They're a total overview, so you can dive in, get to know some people maybe you didn't know about before. And then, you know, go on a spiral online and <laughs> find out everything you ever wanted to know. Enough about yourself. <laughs> oh, right. Sorry, that's just me? Oh. <laughs> Great. Well, where can we find you guys online? Uh, well, I have a website, obviously, mitzisoretto.com, and, and I'm on Twitter, and I'm on Facebook, and there's some random bits of me, like LinkedIn and Flickr, if anyone <laughs> even goes there. But yeah, yeah, Facebook, website, and uh, Twitter, that's it. Perfect. We'll post them all yeah, we'll for yes, everyone, please, thank too. You. How about you, Mike? I'm everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Just just search for dark poutine, and it's poutine is spelled like routine with a P. So <laughs> like for for... Americans who don't know what poutine is. It's like disco fries. Disco fries. That's all. Disco like. fries. <laughs> I know, but there's only so much poutine you can eat. I'm sorry. Well, oh, I love it. I Quick didn't get Canadian this way by anecdote. accident. My, I have family in Canada. I went to Nova Scotia a couple years ago to visit my cousins. Oh, cool. And we went to breakfast, and they delivered a, a basket of toast. And my cousin just deadpan looked at me, and, and I said, what is that? And he said, "Put the, we put the maple syrup on it. It's Canadian. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, what? Totally got me. It was hilarious. I'm like, That's oh, it's funny. just toast. It's, it's <laughs> literally toast. You were waiting for toast. some sort of like special thing about it. I was like, it. how have I not heard of this? Not to be toast. weird, but where in Nova Scotia did you um, go? Well, so my cousin was going to school in Halifax, yep. and I'm not really sure of the town in Nova Scotia. I'd have to look it up. Or okay. I'm, they're kind of like backwoods. Well, yeah. That's, like, I can't I'm kind of backwards, too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I could go into my launch into my real accent, oh, you guys. Oh, do. just for a second. Give me uh, a taste um, of the family. Like, well, it's sort of like Maine, but there's a little German in there too. Oh, okay. So my grandmother was from a place called Upper Northfield, and the way she would talk was, "Over there, I seen this deer, and the deer was walking along that field, and I up my shotgun and do down went the deer. <laughs> oh, the Lord thundering Jesus." <laughs> I like it. It's very like southern, like southern it's US weird, Australian. Right? Yeah, right. It's There's quite all the kinds combo. of a. It's a mess. <laughs> been, been around the world. That's what it is. So yeah, when I went to acting school at Vancouver Film School, uh, part of my goal was to get rid of my hickiness, <laughs> so I didn't sound like a hick. I like that goal. How long did it take? Uh, How mo- long have you been working moments, on that? Is, moments. Is that is that accent kind of the? The Canadian version of like American dirt no. kind of a thing. No. Is that how it's perceived? There's Canadian. No, that that one's more like uh, if you listen to someone from Alberta talk. That. <laughs> oh, hey. oh, throwing some oh, shade hey. in Alberta. Alberta. Hey, a mic yeah. from Canmore. Eh? I was down there the other day eh? and it was just crazy. Those people. <laughs> that is true. I had some beers and I was just nuts. Eh. <laughs> Oh, I, man. Think, I think we need a moose. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, don't you know? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah exactly. And it sounds a lot like the Fargo kind of yeah. because oh, I yeah, guess geez, it's all right there. Yeah, just, just across the water there. It's a little cold you. there, eh? Oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Water. Oh, it's a cold one, huh? <laughs> oh yeah, get the wood chipper. <laughs> Oh, was that your partner there in the wood chipper? Oh, oh geez. Oh, That's how geez. I knew it was his car because he's got Paul Bunyan on the roof. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. Well, thank you so much for joining us today to talk a little bit about your book. Yeah, thank We're you. very excited to share it with our listeners and uh, hope to talk to you again soon. Well, thank you. It was nice being here. Thanks so much. <laughs> it wasn't sarcastic sounding at all. No, I went. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, just picked nice. on me the whole time. <laughs> So we're going to pick up a couple of books that I'm hoping you both will sign. Of course. Yeah. Are you sure. going to stay for the... Um, um, yeah, I think we will stay for... Uh, we're going to go in the back because yeah. we are going to meet some of our listeners upstairs. Okay. That's so we'll great. Pop back down. Yeah, it'll be fun. I mean, I'll be yakking a while. I'll do a reading and then he's going to yak a while oh, and right. do a reading and then we'll do q and I'm not going to yak too long. <laughs> no, he's not going to yak too long. Oh, you got yaks up there, Joe. Yeah. Oh, I got, no, they're bison. <laughs> And if you want to learn more about Clifford Olson and his victims, as well as the legal proceedings, I have a few sources for you to check out. The Beast of British Columbia, written by Elizabeth Broderick, was very well done. I got a copy on Amazon Audible, and I think I had both a a Kindle copy and an Audible copy. So check that one out. It's really well done. And then Peter Worthington wrote Predator, The Life and Crimes of Clifford Olson. And he had a very close look at Clifford Olson. They had worked together. So he has details that nobody has. So check that one out. And then, of course, our friends Mitzi Soretto and Mike Brown came out with the best new true crime stories, serial killers. And there is a chapter on Clifford Olson, as well as a few more people you might recognize. And a big thank you to the Elliott Bay Book Company in Seattle for providing a space for us to do all of our wonderful interviews. And accusing me of stealing, you jerks. My vagine. Oh, no, I go to my friend Emily. Right. Not a a doctor. She's a doctor. (laughs) She comes kind of over and we watch movies and have popcorn. And, and I go, this goes, look good? Yeah. This look okay? She put an IUD in for me one time. It's great. Cool. Like I, at your house? Yeah. Yep. Over. No, at your house. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag guest bathroom. Yeah, get a little. <laughs> Jewelry's guest bathroom. Oh, my God. Okay. How, uh, just Let's so, get through okay. this one. Yeah, how, how many more pages? You don't, We don't need don't, to talk about don't. that. Mm-mm. Okay. <laughs> where she intended to have lunch with her older boyfriend. Much older, older boyfriend. How much older was he? <laughs> much. He was 22. And she was? 16. 16. Yeah. No. No, I mean, that's not like, that is. It could just be older boyfriend. Yes, that's all I meant. Okay. How? <laughs> uh, no, it's cool, baby. <laughs> it's just 16. No, 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 no. No, no, 16 or 7. 16, 22. <laughs> Stop calling me jewelry. Your neighbors are cooking something real nice. Okay. I don't smell it. Cool. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate how much I upset you. <laughs> oh, boy. I wear glasses. I was going to try to go without. But now that you're 38. Shut up. <laughs> it's only been for 48 hours, though. 38 for 48. Mm. Write that down. He was recently charged with a sexual assault, I guess, again, excuse me, but. <laughs> Pardon again, me. Again, again. <laughs> yeah, <that's cool. laughs> Olson had tried his usual. <laughs> <laughs> Just another day uh-huh. in the glamorous life. All right, we didn't warm up. You're good. <laughs> she told him no. So she said she was just fired. Nope. I'm sorry. I'm not prepared, apparently. <laughs> prepared, apparently. <laughs> Very close to where he had hidden Ada's jewelry in a telephone pole. Can you retake that? Yep. I don't think I even want to add telephone pole. Good. Don't. I don't want to. I said so. (laughs) No, my normal voice isn't so sultry. Oh. It's close. I didn't realize it was sultry today. I did. Hey. (laughs) You get out of here. (laughs) Josh noticed. (laughs) When corporal force, when corporal, this was a hard one. When corporal Forsyth heard this, come mm-mm, mm-mm. to tell him that he had gotten to no, she is a her. <laughs> <laughs> Though Ray had called his sister earlier that day to tell her she, <laughs> <laughs> she's stuck now. Why must we have these genders? <laughs> Ray's a boy. Ray is a he, she is a her. Sister is a she. He didn't say where or for what company. Do you want to turn the fridge off? Or... Yeah. I do. Okay. I do. <laughs> was still in prison, so it couldn't be them, him. 
Her friends noted that she had never showed up to the pet shop where they had all... It, no. Her friends noted that she had never showed up to the pet stop... <laughs> were being reported wow that's a that's a redundant sentence idiot mm. but they wanted him to give them something oh no oh dear he was spent or no he was sent <laughs> <laughs> he was spent the bodies for money deal wasn't the only time that hand mm -mm. the bodies for money deal wasn't the only time that handling of clifford olson the handling god damn A lot will learn. A little bit. Talk, talk to her about her new book, The Best New True. Okay. Oh my gosh. I'll have to take that again. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I live on the edge. You don't know. I'm worth. I'm worth. I'm worth it. I'm willing. Like I'm willing. <laughs> you're gold. You're platinum, baby. Murder in the Rain is produced and edited by Josh McCullough. Written and hosted by Emily Rowney and Alicia Holland. Artwork by Jamie Costa. Music by Kai Pfeiffer at kyfifer.com. Check out our website, murderintherain.com, for additional information on all cases, a fun interactive map, and be sure to subscribe so you can receive our newsletter. Check out the Mad Props page for coupon codes from some of our sponsors. We love your reviews and seeing them on all streaming platforms, especially iTunes. And check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And suck my balls. <laughs> Please put that in. <laughs>